I'm here from the Emwood Park Zoo. We're gonna be showing you some animals today. I'm here with my friend, Miss Marissa, and she's gonna explain about these couple animals that were few animals, I guess I should say, that we're gonna to see today. So let me flip around the camera so we can get started. This is Miss Marissa, say hi. Hello, welcome, um, welcome to the Elmwood Park Zoo. Um, so my name is Miss Marissa. I'm one of the educators here at the zoo. So I do a lot of teaching programs with these guys. And um, today we're gonna be meeting three animals. Um, and first up, our very first animal is um, in this enclosure here. Um, and now she is gonna be moving around a little bit. So we'll make sure you guys can get hopefully a good view of her. Um, but her name is Rosie and she is a tarantula. Um, now Rosie is a rose hair tarantula. Um, and they're called rose hair tarantulas because these guys native to Chile um, are actually have a, a rosy color to them. Um, and so um, it, uh, so these guys have that kind of um, really pinkish kind of color, might be a little hard to tell here, but against a different surface, she's gonna look a lot rosier and a lot pinker. Um, so for these guys here, um, now she's called rose hair, but she doesn't have a hair. Um, so she doesn't have hairs on her body. She actually has bristles. Um, so these bristles on her body help to protect her in the wild from predators. Um, so these guys have what's called urticating hairs. And now oh, we know that only mammals have hair. Um, so these guys don't have hair, but those bristles, we call them hairs because they look a lot like hair. Now those bristles, those urticating hairs are super important in making sure um, that these guys uh, stay safe in the wild because they are really itchy. And so what our friend Rosie here is going to do is in the wild, if something swoops in and tries to munch on her, she's actually gonna take her back legs and she's gonna kind of rub them against her abdomen. And it's going to fluff those hairs into the air and it's gonna get in the nose of predators. It's gonna get in their mouth and their eyes and it's gonna be super uncomfortable and very itchy. Um, so these guys are going to, um, you know, really need those hairs to help protect them in the wild. Now. Rosie here is uh, an invertebrate, which means that she doesn't have any bones in her body, but in fact, she's covered in what we call an exoskeleton. Now this exoskeleton allows her to, um, you know, move around and keeps her safe and, whew, looks like, mm -hmm. and it helps her grow. Um, so when Rosie here gets bigger, um, she will molt out of her exoskeleton and she will have a nice new one underneath. So when she molts that, she actually will flip upside down on her back and she'll come out of her uh, old exoskeleton and she'll crawl out. It's almost like taking off shirt sleeve. She's gonna just pull her leg out of her current sleeve and she'll have a nice new one and it'll harden up over time. Now she's not super hard like a beetle might be. Um, they're actually fairly fragile. So some people, some of you might be very nervous about tarantulas. <laughs> I know I was when I first started working with her. Um, but she's actually an incredibly fragile animal. And so for these guys, they're going to um, really rely on, um, you know, hiding and those bristles to keep them safe. But if I were to hold Rosie up and if I were to drop her at all, or if she were to fall from any big height, she would actually not survive that. Her exoskeleton is not hard enough to help her out. So even though we might be pretty scared of these guys, they are incredibly fragile animals and we need to be super gentle with them. Now, wow. Rosie here, that's one of the reasons why we don't handle her here at the zoo. So that's why I have her in this container, right, in this enclosure, um, because it's uh, really important that we don't hold her up because I don't want her to fall and get hurt. So that's really important for us here at the zoo. Um, now, Rosie, um, and she's, uh, you know, I don't know how close you can get to see, but she is actually has spinnerets on her back here. Um, so these guys have what we call a cephalothorax and an abdomen. So when we look at tarantulas, their body parts, they're a little bit different than other insects because these guys aren't insects, right? They're actually arachnids. And that means that they have eight legs and they have two body parts. And so she has her cephalothorax, which is actually her head and kind of her upper body all together. And then she has her abdomen, which is actually that back part there. That's kind of that big round extra furry looking part. And then coming off of that, at the very end of that, the very rear are her spinnerets. And she's actually weaving a web right now. It's just a little what? hard to see. Um, so she's kind of moving those spinnerets around and she's laying a web. Now, tarantulas weigh, lay webs differently than some other spiders, right? We know that some spiders, right, if you're walking through the forest, 
um, or maybe, you know, you come out of a, a door, you walk through a shed door or something, and you might walk into a spider web, right? Or brush cobwebs from the corner of a room. But tarantulas are a little bit different, particularly rose hair tarantulas. So what she's gonna be doing is she's actually gonna lay her web like a big mat on the ground, like a big blanket. And she's gonna lay it down and she's gonna weed it. And she's gonna place it down on the ground because tarantulas have absolutely terrible eyesight. So she is, although she's an ambush predator, she's gonna hunt for her food. She like eats bugs. Um, but for her, um, unfortunately, she is not able to really hunt for her food super well just by looking for them. Um, and you can probably see her fangs, um, which she's is probably She's giving us a show. Yeah, I'm like just stretching it all out. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but for her, she's gonna really need to rely on her other senses and she's gonna rely on her web to help her catch food. Now her web doesn't catch predators or prey rather, um, but it's going to, a, like, let's say a, a beetle comes by and it'll step on her web that she just laid out like a big blanket and it's going to send vibrations. Kind of like if you're on a trampoline and you jump on a trampoline, someone on the other end of the trampoline is going to feel that, right? Something similar to that, where she's going to feel those vibrations moving and that's going to allow her to help kind of feel that food. And then she's going to go hunt it down because remember, she doesn't have good eyesight, even though she has eight eyeballs. She's got eight eyes and she still can't see. Wow. It's a real bummer. Yeah. <laughs> Bad luck. Yeah. But um, so those are kind of a little bit about our friend Rosie the Tarantula and a little bit about um, her, uh, her, you know, uh, her body. Um, now, do you guys have any quick questions about Rosie in particular before we move on to the next animal? I have a question. Yeah. So I assume she's not venomous. Like she, would she harm people? That's a great question. So she is technically considered venomous. However, she's a mild venom. So okay. think about like a bee sting. Mm. So, you know, if you were to get bit by a tarantula, it would be similar to a bee sting. So if you're allergic to bee stings, it might be more of a problem. Yeah. Um, but for her, it's going to be irritating. It's going to hurt. It might swell up a little bit, but it's not going to be fatal for people for a tarantula like this, at least for the Chilean rosehair tarantula specifically. We do know that there are more venomous spiders out there um, and that they're not all safe to touch or to handle, right? Um, just like any wildlife, you want to give them space. Um, but we know that uh, Rosie here, her venom is very, what we would consider to be mild. Um, in Good girl, Rosie. <laughs> so we actually have a few questions. Um, a lot of our kids seem to think that Rosie is super cute. Um, they also know uh, I am freaked out by spiders. So um, <laughs> I'm not going to mention Steven's name, but um, somebody wants to know, are you able to like actually touch the spider or pet the spider without like if we wanted to like touch Rosie would that actually hurt us great question so um similar to her venom in that some people are going to be more impacted than others so her little bristles the little hairs they can be a little itchy um so some people who have very sensitive skin might react a little bit more to her hair so they might be a little itchier but personally, so like for me, I get a little itchier. Um, other people don't, but if I could, I could definitely go in there and gently reach her and like hold her um, and she would be fine with that. Rosie, um, it's funny you say that Rosie is pretty cute. Um, I have yeah. learned to really, uh, you know, uh, enjoy Rosie over the years. It took me a long time because I used to be very nervous around spiders, um, but Rosie has a really awesome personality. She really loves to explore. You can see she's just like, you know, just loves to check out her environment and she's checking everything out. So for Rosie here, um, she is really able to kind of, um, you know, capture the hearts of people that might be a little nervous about spiders. Listen, she can come home with me. The snake from last week, no. <laughs> um, you mentioned the two things that are kind of, I guess, near her bottom. Those, those were, well, you said they were, they were spinners, is that correct? Yep, mm -hmm. so those are her web spinners and we call them spinnerets. And you can see them kind of moving. They kind of move back and forth. And sometimes she'll move one over the other. And that's her, she's like actually laying down her web right now. So um, she's, you know, laying a very fine streak of webbing that's almost impossible to see um, with the eye. Um, but she is laying that down right now. Okay. And what would Rosie normally eat? You know, you mentioned like something like beetles. What's some other stuff that Rosie would eat? 
Yeah, so um, so she is a, a carnivore, so she's only going to be eating meat now, not like chicken nuggets and hamburgers. Mm-hmm. Like she's only going to be eating bugs and other insects and maybe some other arachnids. Um, so Rosie here is going to be, um, you know, mostly munching on, here at the zoo, we actually feed her crickets. Um, and so things like that, you know, small um, to medium-sized insects. She's really not going to be, you know, hunting down spiders that are her size. She could potentially eat another really small mammal, um, but she, you know, it would have to be very, very tiny. Um, so otherwise, she's mostly going to be eating other bugs. Okay. And the final question um, is, is how old, well, actually two questions. How old is Rosie and would Rosie get any bigger? Great question. So. Um, she will continue to grow. Now she won't get much larger than this, um, but insects will continue to molt their exoskeleton. Um, but over time it becomes more, she's molting it to stay clean because her old you know, exoskeleton might get dirty or bristles will fall off or you know, this, that, or the other, scraped up a little bit. So she can just like molt and get a whole new set, um, which is pretty awesome. So she will grow a very, very small, almost negligible amount from here on out. Um, but she's a mostly full-grown tarantula at this size. There are obviously tarantulas that get much, much larger. But for Rosie here, she's not going to get any bigger, really, that we would be able to tell. And in terms of how old she is, Rosie here, from my understanding, she is about, um, I think she's between 8 to 10 years old. And Rosie is potentially going to live into her 20s. Um, now, that is not true of all tarantulas, particularly of all Chilean rose hair tarantulas. In fact, the males will only live about three years maximum. We what? don't know why, um, but we know that the males will live up on average three to five years and the females will live up to 25 years. Because those tarantulas are, are stressing so much. <laughs> right. Yes, um, they, you can have a tarantula as a pet. Um, certain tarantulas, I believe uh, you need special permits for, but right. these guys, the Chilean rose hair, you can um, just purchase at a local store. Wow. Okay, I want to ask, one, I wanna ask this one final question before we move on. Um, Stephen wanted to know, how does Rosie clean herself? How does she clean herself? Oh my gosh, it's a great question. Um, Cause she actually does this thing called like acrobatic cleaning hmm. um, where she will take Um, Because I saw her doing it one day and I kind of panicked because I didn't know what was happening Um, and I had to do research on it. But she'll take her leg and she'll actually run it underneath her fangs by her little mouth and she'll clean the dirt out of her bristles. So she kind of looks like she's like, nom, 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 nom. Wow. And then she does it with all of her legs and it's called like acrobatic cleaning or something because she's like, she'll take all of her legs and kind of bend them up and like use her little mouth to help clean it off. It like is, a cat. Yeah, like <laughs> a cat, um, which is uh, like very cute. Another right. layer to Rosie. Um, so yeah, she definitely takes good care of herself and she'll, you know, do some maintenance like that until she molts uh, a new exoskeleton. Oh, Mr. Sheet came around. He said, oh, maybe Rosie is cute. <laughs> because I'm a good 40 miles away, so. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. yeah. I love from a distance. We'll take it. Yeah. Awesome. Right. Very cool. All right, guys. So we will move on to our very next animal. So real quick, um, this here <gasps> oh. is Jude. And Jude is an Eastern box turtle. And we are also gonna put him in a little bit of a dig box here. And then we can um, move it a little bit, a wee bit closer. Um, So Jude here is um, an Eastern box turtle. Now these guys are native to Pennsylvania. Um, So they're native all up and down the East Coast of the United States. They can be found as far North as New York um, into like, I think New Hampshire, uh, Vermont, and then all the way down to um, South Carolina. So these guys can be found fairly large range all up and down the eastern seaboard. Now, dude here, um, he is, uh, we believe, in his 30s. Whoa. Um, but he has a quite a long life to live. The oldest box turtle on record was about 132 years old. Wow. So he might have another century in him. You never <laughs> know. Um, now, dude has been here at the zoo for quite a long time, so I'm not familiar with his origin story. We're pretty sure somebody had him as a pet um, and could no longer take care of him and ended up donating him to the zoo. Um, now, it is unfortunately now illegal to own box turtles as pets here in Pennsylvania. Um, and so if you if you have one at home, don't go putting them outside. However, um, you know, it's important to remember that it's not 
you know, it's not a good practice to take animals out of the wild. Um, and that's something that we talk a lot about here at the zoo, because unfortunately that means animals like dude that could have lived out in the wild for his whole life, you know, do end up here in a zoo, which is kind of a real bummer. Um, even though we love having dude here, we always want to see animals, you know, spending out their lives out in the wild. Now for dude here, um, he is, uh, as an Eastern box turtle, he has a pretty cool adaptation that helps him survive in the wild. Um, and that is his ability to completely box up his shell. Um, so what dude can do is um, he can actually poke his head all the way in, pull in all of his limbs, and then on his the very bottom of his shell here, he has a hinge. You can kind of see that hinge right there. And he's actually able to close up that part of his shell and he will entirely box his shell up. So just like you'd close up a box, he can close up his shell, which is pretty impressive. Now for dude here, he is going to utilize that if, if he's being hunted by a predator, right? So um, things like foxes or raccoons or even hawks will sometimes prey on box turtles. Um, but thankfully that shell keeps him pretty safe. Now for dude here, we can actually tell that he is a, a boy um, or that he's a male turtle by his eye color. So oh. this is really only true for um, Eastern box turtles. Um, but he has bright red eyes. And we can kind of scooch him back a little bit because he's like, yeah, I'm just checking everything out. Yeah, it's um, like, he's ready to cruise, yeah. Um, and so for dude here, he's going to have those bright red eyes. And that's how we know that he is a male. In fact, the females have more of a brown eye color. Um, and that's kind of an indicator to tell us the difference. Now, um, you can kind of see dude has some coloration on his face and on his shell a little bit. And that is the coloration is kind of an orangey color and box turtles, particularly Eastern box turtles can have a wide variety of colors on them from yellows to oranges to browns um, and even some reds. And that's gonna allow them to kind of blend in with their surroundings here in Pennsylvania, which is pretty impressive. Um, now uh, for dude here, he is considered an omnivore. So he is a turtle, but he's not really a swimming turtle. He's more of a terrestrial turtle. Not quite a tortoise, but he's going to spend a lot of his time in the forested areas of Pennsylvania near creek sides, but he's not really going to go swimming in the creeks. And that's because dude here is not meant for swimming. He does not have webbed feet. He does not have a streamlined shell. He's got kind of a big bulky shell and he's got kind of stompy feet to help him move around. Um, but he is an omnivore, which means that he's going to be eating a wide variety of foods from you know, anything from veggies to fruits to um, plants and grasses, maybe even uh, he'll eat worms and bugs and um, yeah, pretty much anything he can find, he's going to try to munch on. Um, a fan favorite for our friend dude here are strawberries. He's a really big fan. In the wild, they might eat some mushrooms growing around. Um, so they're really going to find pretty much anything to eat. And one of the cool things about box turtles is that they do really enjoy worms. Nice. And now something you might not have, something you may have noticed is on really rainy days, particularly in the spring, you know, if it's raining really heavy, you might see worms all over the sidewalk, all over a driveway or the road. You might see them all over the place. And that's because um, worms, they need to come up to the surface if the, you know, if the ground becomes too saturated with uh, water because they need to be able to breathe. So they'll come up to the surface and um, you know that's a great meal for birds or turtles alike. But what box turtles will do is they will actually go into a forest and if they're feeling a little hungry and they need a snack, they might stomp their feet in order to mimic rain. So that way worms will come up to the surface and then they can munch them up. So they're a little bit of tricksters, these guys. Wow, they're pretty um, smart. Yeah, very, very intelligent animals um, that are gonna you know, really use everything that they have to help them survive in the wild. Now, box turtles um, and like other turtles, they do have a shell. Now, turtles are unable to come out of their shells. One of the biggest myths that's out there with cartoons, you know, they really make us believe that turtles can just ditch their shell like a hermit crab and go get a new one. But the reality is that turtles are born in this shell and it will grow with them. So unlike our friend Rosie, who's molting her exoskeleton and going to get a new one, our friend dude here, he is born with this shell as it is a part of him. It is made out of bone and it is so just another bone in his body and it will grow with them just like our bones grow with us. 
And then for him, he's going to be able to, it's going to grow with him as he eats and grows bigger. And then he'll have the shell for his entire life. Um, so it is covered in scales that we call scoots that allow him to protect that bony shell underneath. So a turtle without a shell is not really a turtle anymore. They can't really survive without that because their shell is actually a bone. And it not only is it a bone, but it's actually their backbone. So if you take a look right here along the middle, there's a big line kind of going across. You can see some of the designs follow that line. And that is actually his spine. So that is his backbone. Um, and the inside of his shell is the whole spine. Um, and that's attached to the rest of the bones in his body. Could he crawl out of here if he wanted to? Oh yeah, if he really had enough um. So that's why I'm not too far away because he could. He loves to adventure and explore, <gasps> and he really just needs to put a, you know, put a hand on one of those little lips. Yeah. And be like, bye. Yeah. Um, I'm out of here. Yeah, dude is quite uh, just like Rosie, you know, quite the adventurer. These guys really love to cruise around and explore, um, and dude in particularly loves to go for walks. We'll bring him outside here at the zoo, oh, and you know, really let him. Um, kind of meander around um, and enjoy the outside and get some UV rays, which are really important for bone growth too. Those, you know, sun, sunshine. Awesome. So we, we have a lot of questions about dude. Um, one you mentioned that, uh, you know, he's not really a, a you know, a swimming turtle, but can, can dude swim? Um, so dude cannot really swim in, in like the way that, uh, you know, a sea turtle or another aquatic turtle could swim. Um, he could kind of paddle his way across a very shallow pond, um, but it would have to be a really small and really shallow and he really, you know, would take a lot of effort. Um, so although he could kind of make his way around, he really can't like dive down or swim like that. And you mentioned it's illegal to have box turtles as pets now um, mm -hmm. in Pennsylvania. Why is that? Yeah, so um, unfortunately, um, you know, uh, a couple of generations ago, um, it was pretty common to take turtles out of the wild, particularly because these guys were everywhere. Um, so you could, you know, you found them in your backyard, you'd be like, oh, what a cool pet, you take them in, you know, I know that my, I had aunts and uncles and grandparents that had them as pets. And um, unfortunately, um, these guys have a very late, um, like reproductive cycle. So they don't mature enough to lay eggs until they're like 10 to 15 years old. Wow. So that means that population regeneration is very slow. So the more turtles that were taken out of the wild, the less turtles that were laying eggs were out and about. So their population plummeted to near extinction, actually. Wow. Um, so in, uh, I believe, the 80s and 90s, they found out that there was their population was decreasing at such a rapid rate that they needed to do something immediately about it. Um, and what they did is they outlawed taking them as pets. Um, so then that way they could, their population could rebound. So now you might see a lot more turtles than you did 10 to 15, to even 20 years ago, um, because they are, um, really regenerating and they're, you know, thanks to that rule, you know, people don't take them out of the wild anymore and they are able to lay eggs and to, you know, their population has been increasing, which is really awesome. So now they're considered, they're not considered endangered anymore. They're really just considered, you know, a vulnerable species, you know, threatened by potential, you know, human factors. Wonderful. Um, the, does dude bite? Does dude bite? Yeah. Oh, great question. Um, so here at the zoo, we like to say, anything with a mouth can bite, yeah. um, which is true. Just like, you know, you and I have mouths, we can bite, we bite our food. It's really important. Um, now dude here doesn't have any teeth in his mouth. Turtles have beaks. Um, so those beaks are gonna allow them to munch on things. Now, if I'm comparing turtle bites, a bite from dude, uh, now disclaimer, he's never bitten anybody here at the zoo. He's only ever bitten his food. Um, if he got really stressed out, he might potentially bite. Um, but we like to make sure that we read his cues and make sure he's comfortable. So we try not to take him out. Um, but for example, a bite from dude would be, you know, would not hurt in any way, really, you know, it might feel like someone pinched your finger. Um, however, if you get bit by something like a snapping turtle, you could potentially lose a finger. Yeah. So, you know, uh, even though I say, you know, dude's bites are not, you know, not super detrimental. Um, I would be super careful about, you know, um, I would say, you know, any other turtles, snapping turtles can be very dangerous. Um, so you have to be super careful. Um, so although they don't have any teeth in their mouth, their bite could still pack quite a punch. All right, two more questions about dude. One, um, you know, obviously we, we saw, you mentioned about uh, the shell being kind of like, you know, it's bone and how the middle is its spine. If you were to, you know, pet dude, you know, is he going to feel it? And would he actually like it? 
Yeah, good question. Um, so dude here in particular is not the biggest fan. Um, not I'm sorry, not not that he's not a fan. He doesn't react to it quite as much as some of our other turtles and tortoises. We have a tortoise here that absolutely loves butt scratches. So we'll like scratch him right on his little like shell right here. So dude is like, uh, I mean, whatever, it's fine. Yeah. Um, but our we have a tortoise here named Hank who is he'll come over to you, he'll turn around and be like, Hey, scratch my shell, please. And he's really into it. So they can feel it. However, um, it's more like how you would feel your fingernails. So you feel the pressure, you would feel that something's touching it, but it's not like your, like your fingers, right? Or your skin where you can kind of feel it on a different level. Um, you're going to feel it a little differently, but yes, they absolutely can feel it. So we're always very gentle regardless, you know, whenever we hold them, you know, you can like tap on his shell and it's not going to hurt him, um, he's, but he is absolutely going to be able to feel that. And the final question we had, uh, which I thought was interesting because you mentioned these turtles are in Pennsylvania, they're all around. How should one handle if, let's say they're on a hike or they're in the wild and they see a box turtle that's hurt? Oh, okay, and it's hurt. Yeah, absolutely. So a couple things. So you're gonna encounter turtles potentially trying to cross the road or you might potentially you know, find an injured turtle. So the best thing to do if you find an injured turtle is to contact um, a, a wildlife rehab center, they're going to be the best bet to kind of help out. Um, and in that case, you know, they're going to be able to tell you where to bring the turtle. You, have, you often have to bring the turtle to them. Um, but you want to be super gentle, you know, based on whatever's happening with the turtle. If it's a broken shell, you know, you obviously want to be careful. Um, but typically, I would transport them in, you know, some kind of container um, and take them. Typically, we recommend with box turtles, they don't really have depth perception. So they can, when they see through a clear environment, they just think that they can go through it. That's why we use a more opaque container with him. Um, so you just have to be careful because it could stress them out if you're just like in a glass box. Um, and then, yeah, you just want to try to get them to a wildlife rehab center as soon as possible because turtles, although very hardy, need super specific care. Um, Here he goes. To go hang out with Rosie. I know. They're both very good for um, education. Yeah, they're awesome. Um, and then in terms of if you see a turtle trying to cross the road, this is one of the biggest times I see turtles and you want to be super careful, right? Um, you always want to make sure you have a grown up with you um, before you're, you know, get um, go near a road or try to cross a road. Um, but generally you want to move the turtle in the direction that they're going. Um, so if our turtle here is trying to move across the road, you know, you want to pick him up and you want to move him across in the way that he is moving. Now that might look a little funny sometimes if he's coming from a wooded area and it looks like he's moving towards a parking lot, you might be inclined to put him back in the forested area. But the reality is he's just gonna try to cross the road again. Yeah. So, you know, even if it doesn't look right or if it looks a little silly, you still wanna put him in the right direction, right? Um, so just like you would help a person cross the road, you wanna help a turtle cross the road in the same way, right? You don't wanna take, you know, if you're helping the little old lady cross the road, you don't wanna take the little old lady home and put him in your local pond, right? You wanna just help her cross the road. So mm -hmm. same deal with our, our turtle friends. You wanna help them cross in the direction that they're headed. Now, one of our students asked um, if dude went to school uh, but I do have an interesting question. You know, uh, do groups of turtles have a, a unique name? You know, if you have a group of fish that's called a school, is there a specific name for a group of turtles or tortoises? You know, um, I, I don't know if there is a name for them. That's a great question. You guys will have to Google it and uh, let me know if you find anything. <laughs> um, because I'm not, generally these guys don't hang out in groups. So, you know, we have group names for a lot of animals that do hang out together, but most turtles and tortoises tend to be solitary animals. So they really generally try to hang out by themselves. So I don't know if there's necessarily a term for a group of turtles, um, but there, I mean, there might be. People have names for everything. So I'm sure there's a name for it somewhere, um, but I don't necessarily know. And in terms of does dude go to school, he goes to uh, like people's schools to go visit. He does not sit in a turtle school himself, um, but we do lots of training with a lot of our animals here where they are learning actively how to do things. So it does definitely depend on the animal, but they kind of go to school here at the zoo by, uh, you know, learning a lot about different um, things that they, you know, different um, behaviors and stuff to do. All awesome. right, dude, make sure you get good grades this year. I love his name, dude. Yeah. You're like, oh, okay, that's easy going, just like yeah. him. Yeah, he's a pretty chill kind of guy, yeah. so it fits him very well. And he's 30. Like, yeah. I hope I look that great. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Hi, dude. Do you guys have any more questions? 
Very cool, huh? Which which one did you like more, Rosie or Dude? I don't know. I kind of like Rosie. I feel like Rosie's been putting on a show. Dude's yeah, like, dude's like, you know, this is what I do, guys. I just relax. Rosie is adorable. Yes, Quinn, I agree. I'm not so scared of Rosie anymore. Do you guys have any questions? Does anybody have a turtle or a spider of any sort at home? No. no. I don't think so. Well, I then this is the. People mentioned that they had some run ins with turtles and spiders, but I don't think anyone has one as a pet. Well, then this is very, very. Oh, Renji, you have both. You have a spider and a turtle at home. That's awesome. Cool, Renji. And dude is 30 years old. Is that right? Yes. Dude looks good for 30. <laughs> and dude can live to be 130, right? Yeah. Oh my gosh, dude, you got a long way to go, pal. Now, did we have one more today? Or are these the only two buddies we want to hang out with today? So I do have one more animal. So I, I'm kind of running a little bit out of time. So see you later, dude. Um, but I can show her real quick for you guys. I did bring her out. Perfect. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to bring her out and I'll introduce her. And then if you guys have questions, you guys can just ask your questions um, Amazing. right away. That way uh, they have to get back to their, their little homes in the zoo. <gasps> Oh my gosh. Hello. <laughs> so this is our very last friend today. Her name is June Bug and she is an African pygmy hedgehog. Wow. I assume she's prickly, right? That's she why you're wearing gloves. pretty prickly. Yep, that is where I'm wearing some gloves today. Well, she um, get very big. So this is fully grown for her. <gasps> so she's not going to get any bigger than this. Um, and so these guys stay fairly small. Um, and so she is native to Africa and these guys are considered pygmy, which means small. There are hedgehogs that get a little bit larger, but they are not in the same family as porcupines that get much larger, right? Porcupines are actually a type of rodent and these guys are actually not rodents at all. Um, so they're a little bit different. Um, so hedgehogs here, they are um, uh, omnivores. And so she is covered in these spines to help protect her from all the kinds of wildlife that are living on the African savanna where she's from. So think wild dogs and hyenas and lions wouldn't really be snacking on her, but um, all sorts of other, um, you know, carnivores and cats and dogs and um, you know, hawks and owls and things like that. So she's really got to protect herself with these spines. Now they spines, they really are just like toothpicks. They're like pointy toothpicks. Um, so they won't stick in your hand. Like if you were to touch a porcupine, your hand would come away filled with quills. Um, but for her, these spines are just specialized hair. She's like, um, <laughs> oh, she made a noise too. Yeah, she kind of hisses a little bit. She's, She's like, like um, get off. And I'm having a great time. You do not need to bother me. Oh. Um, but those spines are going to be super prickly and help her survive in the wild, which is pretty awesome. How old is she? So she is uh, turning four years old this year. Oh, she's little. And then how long do they live? So she's going to live roughly, um, they can live up to about 10 years. They average about um, six to eight years. Oh, yeah, okay. So they don't live very long at all. No, not like the tortoise. Now, how did she end up um, at the zoo? Yeah, so um, Junebug was actually born at the Philadelphia Zoo. Oh. Um, and so the Philadelphia Zoo actually has a breeding colony of uh, pygmy hedgehogs. And so uh, we have three hedgehogs here, and they all came from the Philadelphia Zoo. That's great. Uh, so she just moved to the suburbs. I get it. Yeah, she just wanted the She wanted life. to retire. Um, is, is her belly soft compared to the quills on her back? Yes, absolutely. So she has some like white fur and you can kind of see it around her face just a little bit, but that white fur will extend underneath um, her belly. Um, and so her belly is pretty soft um, and that's why she'll curl up into a ball um, to help protect herself in the wild because her belly is very vulnerable. Whereas her, those spines that cover her back are um, really gonna help, you know, uh, help her out. And, um, and so, so she'll just curl up into a ball to stay safe. And she can't, like, I know some cartoons show stuff like this, but she can't, like, fire off her quills from her body, right? 
No, that's a great thought. Um, so yeah, unlike like Sonic the Hedgehog that can like curl up into a ball and start rolling around, she can't do that. Um, and she can't shoot her spines at all. Her spines are actually just hair um, that are attached to the muscle on her back. So she'll just tense that muscle and those hairs just kind of stand straight up. Um, but that's about it for her. So she doesn't necessarily like shoot them or anything like that. They just stick straight up when she tenses that muscle. And how's her eyesight? It's terrible. Um, yeah. So yeah, just like very similar to our, our tarantula friend, um, hedgehogs are nocturnal animals. So they're actually gonna rely on their other senses to move around. So for June bug here, she's gonna rely on her sense of hearing as well as her sense of smell and her sense of touch, of course. You know, she's very, she'll react when I touch her, right? Um, and that's important for her. Um, but she's gonna rely, you can see she's sniffing right now. She's checking everything out. So she's just gonna use that sense of smell to explore her environment, but she is not going to um, have very good eyesight at all. Okay, and what does, what does June Bug like to snack on? Oh, so June Bug, she absolutely loves to snack on, um, I would say mostly um, bugs. Um, so she is another omnivore, just like dude. Hi, lady. But she's actually what we consider to be an insectivore, which means that her diet mostly consists of insects, but she will eat plants as well. Um, so for her here at the zoo, she gets a special insectivore diet, lots of um, mealworms, as well as some fruit um, a couple times a week. She's just ready to- I know, she's like, I'm out of here. She's another adventurer, this one. All right, does anybody have any more questions? I know we're running a little low on time, but anyone have any more questions about Junebug? And I think I think we might have covered, I know, um, and a lot of times we, we do get a chance to see hedgehogs because we are um, very, very lucky. But I think we've covered all the questions that we normally get about hedgehogs, so. Um. Awesome. Well, guys, why don't you say bye to our friends? Bye. Hey, she's so later. cute. I don't know which one I think is, I guess she's the cutest to me. <laughs> what do you guys think? Got all three of those fun friends, all very different. Very cool, guys. Well, let's say thank you so much to Miss Marissa. She was a wealth of information. Now we know so many things about our new friends. Uh, real quick, uh, is there anything, Marissa, that you could tell us that might be going on that's, that's special at the Elmwood Park Zoo um, in the next couple of weeks? Ooh, um, that's a great question. Um, I uh, don't know of anything specific, um, but we are open every day um from 10 to 5 and um we have all sorts of giraffe feedings here at the zoo um you can meet our goats in our goat yard which is actually right over here um and uh you know come see all of our animals and the, we've got our carousel open and our treetop adventures zip line course yeah we have all sorts of fun things here at the zoo so yeah if you guys are close by we hope to see you wonderful okay and Maya, i see you have your hand up can you put your question in chat and i'll be able to ask if you have a question and what we're going to do, everybody, is we're going to say bye to Miss Marissa after this. Um, and I know um, Amina wanted to show off her cat. So I want to stop the recording and let Amina show off her cat. And we can ask questions about the kitty, too. All right. So, guys, oh, uh, quick question. Um, I know you mentioned all animals bite. But as far as with hedgehogs, uh, do they bite more than others? Do hedgehogs bite more than others? Like, yes. Yeah. Um, hedgehogs definitely can be a little bitier. I would say, honestly, in terms of like Rosie or Junebug the Hedgehog or the Turtle, um, Junebug the Hedgehog is definitely the most <gasps> likely to nom on my fingers, for sure. Oh, because she's the cutest. See what <laughs> happens? She has to protect herself. Great questions today, guys. Thanks so much for joining me at the zoo. I hope you guys have an awesome weekend. And don't forget to send me your passport so I can send you guys prizes, okay? Take care. Have a great weekend.